Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me from deep in the heart of Texas is my colleague, Cecily nelson Zander. Hello, Cecily. How are you today? I'm good, Chris. How are you? I am well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm delighted to have Cecily with us today because she is Emerging Civil War's new chief historian. Congratulations. Thank you. So you join an illustrious lineup of uh, some of our colleagues, uh, Chris White, our founding chief historian, Dan Davis, Chris Kolakowski, and now you. What does it mean to be chief historian? Well, it means I need to start writing more books, I think. Um, those guys have published an immense amount. Um, it's it's really, to me, um, given how much I admire all of the work that they've done, um, just such an honor to be included in the same kind of sentence uh, as as those folks. And um, to be in this role uh, with Emerging Civil War, which I think I joined about two and a half years ago now and um, has really just helped me kind of find a Civil War community beyond the traditional kind of landscape of academia. Um, that's kind of was my training. And um, I find that with Emerging Civil War, the chance to do public outreach, to talk to people um, and to interact with them just through the blog in terms of people who love history is kind of my favorite uh, thing to do. So to be able to kind of help um, the organization shape kind of that next generation of Civil War historians uh, is super exciting. So um, it's I, I'm really excited kind of to move forward with this opportunity to work with folks like you, Chris, and with uh, Sarah Byerly and the wonderful team uh, at ECW, who have been so good to me, and I hope I can pay that forward. Uh, well, we know that you've got great things ahead of you. Uh, you've done some great things already. Uh, you know, you came on our radar screen. I'll tell my side of the story. I'll ask you to tell your side of the story. Um, we were looking for some folks to be on the editorial board for our Engaging the Civil War series published through Southern Illinois University Press. And uh, my co-editor there, Brian Matthew Jordan, said, hey, how about uh, Cecily Nelson Zander? And I didn't know who you were. But I trust Brian implicitly because he's plugged into some great stuff and he's just a historian I really admire. And so that's what got us connected. And uh, it was like we won the lottery. It's like, wow, oh, my gosh, this woman is just fantastic. <laughs> so so tell me your side of that story and, and you know, your own journey um, from academia toward, uh, toward where you are now. Sure. Um, it was so kind of Brian to do that. I think I'd, you know, run into Brian at various um, meetings, academic conferences, and and Brian is someone who so successfully sort of transcends that academic and public historian uh, boundary. Um, he just has the kind of beautiful writing skills and and also the kind of battlefield tour giving uh, ability to to do that. Um, you know, which is something I hope you know one day to kind of model myself on. I think it would be unfair um, not to acknowledge that most of my mentors, um, whether in the field of academia or otherwise, are great public historians. And so I was so lucky um, at the University of Virginia to study under Gary Gallagher and at Penn State to study under Bill Blair. And these are people who made a career out of both um, fostering emerging voices and also bringing civil war history to a public audience. Um, and again, I think, um, when y'all reached out to me, it was very much a kind of moment of this is exactly what I was looking for, because I think um, a lot of times when you're in graduate school and you're writing a dissertation, which is a kind of a fundamentally miserable hazing experience, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and you're, you're basically you're talking to four people and you kind of start to go crazy because um, only four people are ever going to read that thing. And um, you're kind of trying to juggle their feedback um, when really what you want to do is say, these are such great stories. I actually want, I want someone to read these stories. I want someone to know about the source I found. I want someone to see this photograph or go visit this place that was so exciting to me. And so um, for me, that kind of outlet was emerging civil war. And so my journey to it was you guys calling me up and saying, hey, do you want uh, to write stuff uh, for people to see? And I thought, gee, I would, <laughs> I would really love for people to kind of <laughs> to see what I'm doing. And, and the other thing is, um, they're, the, the readers at Emerging Civil War are never afraid to tell you what they think in the comment section. And oftentimes, for me, uh, good or bad, that generates new ways of thinking, either to say, I need to write this better, or I need to be more clear, or people are really excited about this. So I'm gonna keep going on, on this path. And so 
I think that's one of the greatest parts about it is that it's not just into the void. It's actually a feedback kind of system that we have at the blog. Well, you know, and that's one of the things that I really like about it. And, you know, some people tend to look down their nose on something like a blog where like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you know like there's this immediate accountability and it's a type of peer review that's maybe not like a scholarly peer review but the feedback is immediate it's passionate um you know it's it's a dialogue it's not just a one-way sort of thing and so um to me it's a very invigorating way to challenge my own thinking i've got to be confident in my ideas put them out there and then throw them into the crucible of public discussion uh right away it's not uh, there's there's not a removal there right right no, and it's exhilarating. And, and I, I guess it's like that. It's like they give it a battlefield tour too. Yeah. You know, like you're out there on the battlefield talking about these things, and and the group that shows up there with you, they're right there with you, challenging, talking. Um, you know, really kind of keeping you on your toes. Yeah, it's so much more live than uh, um, me sitting here all day, uh, and occasionally saying to my dog, "You know, this is great," and he uh, he he's never cared. <laughs> he's like, "When are we gonna go throw the ball?" That's. It's very nice that Edwin Sumner was in Kansas in 1855. I'm, I, that's fine. So you talked a little bit about academic history versus public history. Um, help crystallize that for our listeners just a little bit. Sure. So I think our listeners are probably folks who as easily pick up an academic book as they do a popular history book. Um, you know, something that's not necessarily peer reviewed mm -hmm. um, because they just love the subject. And so you know, a typical academic history book might be something uh, like at UNC Press. They publish an academic history book. It's peer-reviewed, extensive endnotes, footnotes, um, so that other scholars later can come and say, okay, she did this, this, and this, but she missed this, and therefore, you know, we have a, we can say X about it. Um, so it's, it's much more kind of regimented, I think. Uh, there's a very typical format that kind of scholarly projects take on, you know, you typically have a book with five chapters, they could be their individual case studies, but it's kind of a very constrained, self-contained um, system. And oftentimes you're either writing to other historians uh, because it's such a narrow or specific topic, um, or you're writing for a tenure committee because you're trying to get, you know, job security and that's who's going to be reading the book. So you have to be very explicit of saying, this is why it matters, and and here's what I'm arguing, and here's my new evidence, and here's all my footnotes. So I've proven I've done everything um, correctly. Um, I think academic history can also be public history. There are great kind of academic historians who write public history, and I already mentioned Dr. Gallagher, but Ari Kelman also comes to mind, who I was very fortunate to um, have taken classes with at Penn State, who writes uh, academic history but in a very public facing way. And so he advocated uh, for more preservation at Sand Creek as a site for kind of both civil war and sort of broader memory of Western history. And so that's a book that crossed over, I think, between academic and public history. I think a lot of what the folks at Emerging Civil War do um, is very much public history, not that it's not rigorous because everyone on the blog uses footnotes and they'd be more than happy to show you their sources. In fact, I think they're often really eager to show you their sources because <laughs> they're so deep in the archives. It's just, uh, you know, Sarah Byerly's at a new archive every weekend. I can't keep up um, with, with how much research, uh, you know, Sarah does. Um, and so, but she's writing for kind of a broad audience. She's writing in a much more kind of, I would consider it approachable manner. You're not using jargon or big words or kind of making things unnecessarily complicated, which academics love to do. Um, because I don't know what they're trying to uh, necessarily prove, but um, we all, we've all we all been guilty of it. Um, and it's something I really try to be conscious of because I'd like people to read my books, not necessarily, you know, look at it and say, oh, that's just, you know, uh, an academic monograph and it's not very interesting. So I tried to choose a topic for my book that was very broad and very kind of potentially appealing to multiple audiences in the hope that it would reach readers outside of, you know, the university libraries that buy it and the the kind of colleagues that take a look at it. So um, I think public history is just um, written without the pretension sometimes of academic history. And that's not to say academic historians are all pretentious. Brian Jordan is not a pretentious writer. He's a beautiful writer. Um, but again, though there are those that can cross over that um, kind of line. And I think often 
Um, they're the ones that I think the emerging Civil War audience loves to read, loves to hear speak at the annual kind of conference. Uh, folks like that who can really kind of make it exciting and write write it with verve. Um, still have all the kind of evidence and backbone, but um, make it actually fun and enjoyable. Uh, more stories than kind of, <laughs> this is what I always think about. When you write a dissertation, you have to do this whole section about here's who said what. And in 1953, this historian said this. And then in 1980, this historian argued with him. And then in 1997, we changed our minds about this topic. In, in public history, you just say, here's a great story about George Custer. <laughs> and it's nice that a bunch of other people wrote about him, but isn't this a great story? And I guess like in, in you asked me to crystallize something and I talked for seven minutes, which is also a very academic um, <laughs> thing to do. That was, that was wrong. So I've just demonstrated what not to do if you wanna be a good public historian, I think. Well, I think too, with, with public history, you're out on the front lines, you're dealing literally with the public, uh, communicating them with way, in ways that help them connect with the history and, and understand it and, and kind of come to grips with you know, a, a place they're standing or an artifact that they're looking at or a story that they're reading. Uh, and so that engagement becomes really important uh, in ways that uh, I, I think is, is, you know, I always call it that front lines because that's what's going to draw people further in and get into those deeper resources that you might see uh, academic historians use. Right. And I think, I think it, um, I attended an event at the University of Colorado once and, and Patty Limerick said, we need history first responders. The people when something hits the news that can sit down and write a blog post and say, let me put this in context for you. That's public history. That's the frontline kind of attitude you're talking about. And just to be ready to do that, to kind of have a command of the field, but be able to kind of distill it and be like, this is why it matters. So I always look at it in terms of of books, since I'm primarily an author. And uh, you know, you said several times I want people to be able to read my books. I want people to want to read my books. And I think that's maybe another hallmark of a public historian, where they're writing the sorts of things that uh, the public likes to read, because you know, most I would say ninety five percent of of Civil War fans, buffs, students, warriors, whatever you want to whatever term you want to use, um, they, they don't really care about the background of the writer, like. Is it a good read? You know, is it something I want to read and is it well written? Yeah. So tell us about your book. Oh, well, sure. Um, mm. it's it, it is in it's sort of it's in an, a stage of editing. I have a reader's report. So this is something academic presses do. They send it out to someone anonymous and you cross your fingers and hope they say nice things. And in my case, they genuinely did say very nice things, but they also say, um, I'm more interested in this than that. So you kind of juggle all those things, but the book is about the regular army um, of the United States, so the professional army uh, between the war with Mexico and the end of Reconstruction. And it's specifically about um, that, that sort of institution, the army's relationship to the Republican Party, which forms after the crisis in Kansas and then becomes basically the party in power for the Civil War and Reconstruction. So the Republican Party is really the ruling party of the country for most of the period that we both study. Um, but they hate the army and no one's ever written about this or why this is the case. And so my book is about the Republican Party as not only an anti-slavery party, which everyone knows about, but as an anti-army party. Um, and that's deeply related to slavery. Republicans make the argument that um, professional soldiers, people like U.S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman and Philip Sheridan hate the union, they're Democrats, they're conservative, and they don't want to help win the Civil War. They're saying this in 1860 and 63 and 65. Ulysses S. Grant could have ridden into Washington after Appomattox, and some Republican senator would have stood up and said, I don't trust him, <laughs> because he was a professional soldier. It's, it's really a deep-seated and remarkable strain of Republican politics that no one has ever really written about, as well as kind of helping us to understand um, how Americans really embrace the citizen soldier volunteer of the Civil War without having any love at all for the professional soldier, the West Point trained officer, someone who makes the army their profession. They want the Cincinnati George Washington volunteer who responds to the call and then goes home, returns to the farm, to the factory, and to civilian life. Even if professional soldiers are the ones who lead the Union armies to victory, they don't care about them once those surrender documents are signed. And so the book kind of really juggles kind of all of those, those themes, but I was really interested in 
I grew up going to Western history sites like Fort Laramie and Fort Mandan and Fort Abraham Lincoln, where George Custer and the Seventh Cavalry were posted um, before they took their Montana vacation, uh, which, if I recall, didn't end so well. It didn't um, end so well. Um, but, uh, you know, I always got this narrative that those places, life was awful for these soldiers. There was no money. They ate worms. They <laughs> There was seven people there and they got mail once every six months um, that it was miserable. And yet all this kind of literature I was reading said, well, the Civil War made the professional army this incredibly powerful, strong enterprise. And I was like, that doesn't jive with all of the public history that I learned, you know, the the frontline history that I encountered as a kid. So really the project came out of me trying to reconcile this public history that was so compelling that made me a historian and the academic narrative that never made any sense to me. And what I found was that it was actually kind of the public narrative that was actually a lot closer to the historical truth when you um, really dug into the sources. And that's such an idea that's deeply grounded in the founding of the Republic when you've got all these colonists in New England rebelling against British troops quartered in their homes. And, you know, they were scared to death of a standing army and, you know, Washington uh, in his Newburgh address. And, and you know, you know so like there's this huge, huge, you know, history of it and to not see that carried forward. Right. And really, you know, we're talking about, you know, the, the colonialists, uh, the, the colonists grandfathers you know it's right. that generation it's not that far removed no. um, and yet nobody's carried that forward it's that right. seems like a really cool thing for you to have latched on to well i think the it's interesting i think the generation after world war ii wanted to write about any soldier in very glowing terms so we got this celebration of the frontier soldier um which tended to be the professional soldier along with the civil war soldier and we lost some of that complexity i think the country went through this which is great a kind of a national embrace of the soldier but in a post-vietnam post Middle Eastern conflict um, kind of world, maybe it's a lot easier to see the kind of ways in which the American people often can just as easily reject um, soldiers as they can kind of embrace them. And, and in my book, you have both. You have an embrace of the Civil War soldier who saved the Union and ended slavery and a rejection of the professional soldier um, who lives on the frontier, maybe fights Native Americans, um, better stay out of the way because we don't want anything to do with them. So I know somebody's asking, when's this book going to be out? Um, if 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 um work proceeds uh, apace, uh, spring twenty twenty four is our projection at the moment. So I'm supposed to get a final draft in uh, by March. Um, very good, very good. So let's shift gears just a little bit. Um, and your role as chief historian, uh, the first female chief historian we've had uh, joining the ranks of Sarah K. Biley as our, you know, managing editor. So we've got, you know, women in, in strong leadership roles, but what does it mean to you to be the first female chief historian? Um, well, to, to kind of have Sarah, I think I, I see Sarah as a kind of model for, um, you know, I, I'm such an admirer of her sort of career and her path. And so, and her enthusiasm, kind of boundless enthusiasm. Um, as I said, she stays busier than anyone I know. I get exhausted reading what she's doing. I'm like, I'm already tired. She's been to six battlefields today. Um, I stayed home. Um, I think it's it's such a cool kind of, well, it, let me say it speaks to emerging civil wars, kind of the, the range of opportunities it provides. Um, for anyone, uh, I think you, Chris, always say, um, it can be worth as much to you as you are willing to put into it. And so if you have the energy and enthusiasm to pour into emerging civil war, uh, what I have found is that it gives back tenfold in terms of the kind of conversations and the the comradeship with the other authors and, and the board, as well as with the readers. Um, and so, you know, I think I had all kind of male mentors uh, but that's not to, that was a, sort of in the strictly academic sense. But I also was so fortunate to have people like Carol Reardon kind of in my ambit. And, and I think everybody knows, everybody listening to this podcast knows that sort of Carol is an icon, um, not only um, as an academic historian, she was the first female president of the Society for Military History, um, but also just as a battlefield tour leader and a military historian who sort of never... Um, took no for an answer when it came to women can't write about this kind of stuff. She just sort of said, why not? And I'm going to write better books and more books than anyone else. Um, and people are, are going to be blown away by them. I mean, her Pickett's Charge book, her book on Germany and Clausewitz, 
are such kind of models for saying, you know, women can do this and, and they deserve a spot at the table. And, you know, in part, you know, I'd like to think that um, the trail she blazed kind of opens up opportunities like this for other young women who want to do serious, you know, Civil War history, who want to be considered military historians and, and not be kind of put in a box of saying, you can only do social or cultural history or things like that. You can kind of do everything. Um, and so my goal, I mean, is, is to sort of live up to that example um, and to kind of, um, I think emerging civil war already has, I don't know, you might be able to tell me the statistics, but we have huge numbers of female authors and, and women in leadership roles. Um, and I also think of Sharita kind of taking over editing several of our, our series. Um, so I think, Chris, if you're not careful, it's going to be it's going to be all women uh, before before you you kind of give your last wave out the door. Well, it's, uh, which is fine with me. I always tell people it's my daughter who got me into the Civil War. So, you know, my own Civil War history is well grounded in the influence of strong women. So <laughs> I have no problem with that whatsoever. I mean, and to me, that is, you know, and that's kind of, you know, one reason why I I do tend to pay attention to women in leadership roles because, you know, when my daughter was growing up, I wanted her to have role models, you know? And so I, I've really tried to do a lot over my own professional career to create opportunities for women so that my daughter would have people she could look, uh, look up to and say like, Hey, I can do that. So, uh, you know, that's why it's important to me because I do think that role models can be very inspiring. You talk about Carol Reardon and, you know, she's someone I just think the world of, she's wonderful. Uh, she happens to be a woman, but she's a fantastic historian. She's just done right. some great stuff and she's a role model for all of us. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of where I come from with all that stuff. And, and I'm glad that, you know, you're in a position now where you can, as you say, pay it forward and serve in that role model capacity. So, so do you have any goals or, or ideas or uh, plans as chief historian? Oh, well, gosh, um, that's a good question. I think with, um, I'm not sure the listeners know, and if I can't talk, I mean, the, the new website, I think, is just going to bring huge numbers of new readers. So I would just love to see kind of people take on bigger topics um, to talk with our authors about, you know, um, taking on bigger questions and getting more conversation going. Um, you know, a personal goal to be more active in the comments to kind of both respond to our authors and also to our readers um, is a goal of mine. I think I've been in the um, kind of one year um, post PhD PTSD period, and I'm finally kind of emerging from the, the fog and, and kind of getting a schedule back and, and being able to kind of engage with the community more. So that's a personal goal is to be kind of engaging with the content that our authors write and reading kind of everything every day um, instead of kind of catching up at the end of the week, which is often <laughs> kind of what was often what I was doing um, previously. Um, I hope that we can boost kind of even some of our social media engagement. I think though that landscape is going through kind of big disruption yeah. at the moment, given kind of current events, but um, to reach bigger kind of crowds of folks and um, folks who I know would love our stuff, um, but maybe... Um, we haven't gotten their ears or their, uh, you know, clicks keyboard yet. Um, um, if anyone has ideas, um, um, I think we're we're all ears for that. Wow. Um, uh, but yeah, just to see more kind of folks come in, and and I'd like to see, though you know, I don't I don't necessarily have a clear um, idea of how to do it yet. But but more folks like me who are in an academic history program or setting, maybe by default or because you know. I think a lot of kids um, are victims of what I call the Pizza Hut personal pan pizza syndrome, like the Pizza Hut personal pan pizza to graduate school pipeline, which is that when we were kids, we were told if if you read a lot of books, you get free pizza. And then we got PhDs. <laughs> There's a direct link between those. <laughs> I'm I do remember that convinced. program. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have kids. I do. Um, I do. <laughs> um, and maybe they made better choices than me and, and managed to get out before they were in too deep. But uh, but to see more more people, because I know academic historians, especially younger folks who are fluid, kind of are fluent in the social media landscape and, and writing kind of for public audiences to to find their way to emerging civil war and, and to start writing for us. Um, uh, because I think um, there are so many people I know who do great topics, but they don't have a sense of where to kind of um to, to get them out to, to a bigger audience. And so, um, you know, I'd love to just see, 
um, them pop up amongst amongst our authors and, and our writers um, and, and to, to kind of provide those opportunities. Uh, but but those would be a few. Um, uh, is there are there others I should I should have? You oh, those can... are pretty good. The, yeah, okay. the, the... <laughs> You're those the several big pieces of cake right. that you have just cut right. off for yourselves. <laughs> I think I think the the commenting on 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 the blog more often would be it's just kind of the way I really want to kind of get yeah. even my little avatar, you know, so to say. <laughs> we're here and we're engaging, um, which I think is is a great thing uh, yeah. to do. So is there anything I haven't asked you that I should have? I don't think so. Um, you didn't ask me about the Denver Broncos, which was very gracious and kind of you. I, having suffered through bad football seasons of my own in the not too distant past, I am sympathetic. Um, bad is an understatement, Chris. Um, it's, <laughs> it's abysmal. And I made the mistake of taking several of them for my fantasy team, which uh, was, was just doubling down on misery. But that's yeah. fine. Again, I went to graduate school. I'm an expert. Uh, <laughs> You know I don't mean to sound ungrateful for, for graduate school, but it is it is just, as you know, Chris, it is a uniquely harrowing time in one's life. It is. It is. So now you have time for things like sunshine and puppies and right, know, walking, <laughs> walk, walking outside, <laughs> seeing the seasons change. But that was that was partially Pennsylvania's fault. There's only really one. Se there's two seasons. There's the gray season. And then the humid season. That's my yeah. my Pennsylvania hot take. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because yeah, I come from a part of Pennsylvania that it is one of the most beautiful places in the world in autumn, you know, when all the leaves change right. on the mountains. It's gorgeous. Sure. So, but you do have to be able to go outside to see that. That's true. I grew up in Colorado. There's more more there's 300 days of sun a year. And then when I got to Pennsylvania, they said, Well, you have more cloudy days than sunny days. And I thought, well, this isn't going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Cecily, I am delighted to have you as chief historian, and I'm really looking forward to the dynamic things you're going to do for us. So thanks. For, well, thank you, Chris. Yeah, thanks for answering the call. Oh, well, no problem. <laughs> for Cecily, I'm Chris Wikowski. Thanks so much for being with us. We will see you online and on the battlefield.